we are not in the same position as we were before. We are in emergency mode. We are, it, it's not predictable. There is no um, indication in sight that this particular situation that is happening in Pune is going to end. It could be a month, three months, a year, or more. So the decisions that are made at this council would have grave impact on the county. You know, I made some statements um, a week ago in regards to how this is not only affecting Hawaii County, but it's also affecting the, the whole state of Hawaii. As we look towards people canceling reservations in the uh, hotel industry, um, cruise ships also canceling, people are uh, small mom and pop uh, stores are are uh, laying off their workers. So we're talking about major impacts, not only for our island, but for the rest of the state as well. So we are very fortunate, very, very fortunate. The governor was able to get a proclamation done, remove the uh, pentane from um, um, the geothermal area, and was able, we were able to look at some of the wells, to close some of the wells. And we're monitoring all of these very, very carefully. But we also have um, support from the um, National Guard. Uh, the governor has uh, given the authority to General Hara, who is a um, native of uh, Waikia High School and this island, to have complete command over the National Guard and even Pua to give us assistance. And <clears throat> by also getting FEMA here, definitely helps ahead of time. So we are going to be, the county is going to be addressing property taxes. We're going to be addressing how the insurance companies can get their insurance uh, for these homes that are uh, over 40 homes that are burnt down by the lava to be able to assess them so that they can, you know, get, um, get moving into their lives. You have many of the departments here today. Park and Re Recreation is doing the best that they can to give the people on this island the opportunity for shelters. We are providing three meals a day at the shelters. We have um, shelters available for, for everyone. We still have a capacity of 800 people down in the Pune area. We have um, the Keau area as well. But also contingency plans have already been made in case this particular event goes south in other shelter areas as well. But all of this is going to incur cost. And, and I appreciate all of you that what you're doing in addressing this concern. But um, unfortunately, the mayor is not here today. Uh, he's at uh, civil defense. And um, you know, it's, 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 not, um, it's not a good time. And I uh, appreciate what you're doing. And, um, if you have any questions for me or Deanna, Deanna has all the information in regards to the <laughs> the financial part, but I'm just giving the overview. Thank you, Deanna. Uh, before ahead. we go any farther, I just want to clarify, it's not Target that's closing, it's Kmart. Okay, oh, Kmart. Kmart. Yes. Sorry, okay. so, so um, uh, my phone was blowing up here. Um, yes, so, um, so yes, we just um, wanted to clarify that. But um, Deanna Sacco, Director of Finance. And um, so we did prepare a presentation, as I promised yesterday, because there is um, a lot of information we all need to know as we jointly decide how we're going to move forward. So we are here today to present the mayor's amended budget that was um, submitted on May 4th. If we had submitted it on May 5th, it probably would have looked a lot different. Um, <coughs> Um, the major changes um, from 2018, the current year we're in, to 2019, and this is overall in the budget, are primarily mandated increases. We have 9.9 .9 million salaries and wages, and as you all remember, we collective bargain, collectively bargain together with the other counties in the state as we're required by law. We have 7.4 million in post-employment um, medical benefits as um, well as our regular um, health benefits, and then 4.4 million increase in retirement contributions. And all of these are mandated by state law that we participate together with the state. 
Um, we did have an increase of 525000 in real property tax sale and expenses, but as a reminder, that's an offsetting revenue and an offsetting expenditure. It's not new cost. It's just how we account for them. Our debt service did go up slightly by 620000 um, We did increase our claims and judgments account by $500,000. Um, there is a large case that has been pending for several years that we believe will be um, being settled in the upcoming year, so we need to prepare for that. Um, and then civil defense um, grant match, $175,000. We've been very fortunate over the years that civil defense receives a large number of grants from Homeland Security, um, and there's never been a match. And now in the coming fiscal year 19 grant, um, we will be required to match that at 175000 um, Initially, this was something we actually added in the May budget because initially I know they're usually about two years behind. They have three years to spend the money. So I thought the match wouldn't be needed for like two more years when they actually get ready to spend this money. However, the federal government would like to see the match in our budget so they know we are prepared to um, have that um, pay our share. So really um, not too many different things that um, make up the major changes. Um, our pie chart does show, you know, police, fire, and everyone. The big purple section is actually our fringe benefits, which is a significant portion of our budget, 22%. Just the changes from March, the more significant changes, real property tax revenue did increase by $1.7 million. That was just as we finalized values and got the final appeal amount. There was no you know, major changes. It um, assumed the same tax rates as the current fiscal year. There were some slight um, grant revenue increases. We were, because of that increase in real property tax, we were able to restore the council contingency funds of 270000 um, we added 200000 for Albizia hazard mitigation as the community is trying hard to, you know, um, determine how and to get rid of those Albizia trees and prevent them from spreading. The civil defense grant match that I mentioned, we were able to restore the additional 500000 to nonprofit grants to have it be the same as the current year. And then we also increased vacation pay by 255000 because we realized that um, we have many um, police and firefighters who are at that retirement age. Um, I believe that at the police department especially, they've had a lot of retirements. They have one of their largest recruit classes that's actually qualifying for retirement now. So um, we know even on the, uh, during the current fiscal year, there was a strain on that account, so we increased that as well. So that's where we were at on May 4th. Um, beginning on May 3rd, our lava event um, started, and I'm going to ask Lisa to come up to kind of talk about the next slide as well. But um, this particular slide has um, Leilani Estates and Laopuna Gardens in it. And then the next slide has a bigger area that Lisa's going to explain um, basically what we believe the impact on real property taxes will be in the coming year. Good morning, Lisa Mira, Real Property Tax Administrator. Um, from the meeting yesterday, you guys wanted a little bit more detailed information and our best estimate about what would happen to real property taxes. And I realize all of council was here yesterday, but for those watching it um, on TV or from their offices and for the other directors here, we really are doing all we can to estimate it, but it's a very fluid situation. It continues to change and surprise us every single day. And it is not an easy thing for people who usually work on past values to come up with what's going to happen in the future. With that said, you did want a figure of about how much this was going to cost us within a range. And even though we gave a range yesterday, and that was printed in the paper, um, you wanted us to kind of get a little bit more exact. And so if we look at the impacted area, which if you can see in zone A, has the orange area, which is a pretty good indicator of the f where the flow is right now and the damage that it's already done. We are already at a loss for 2017. 
just from having to prorate taxes of approximately $30,000, and that's still growing. For 2018, just for that little orange area, it's closer to 200,000. And if you consider the larger area of Leilani and Lani Puna Gardens, and just that little area around there, um, that was the larger number of 1.2 million we gave you yesterday. Now what you have to remember is the only thing that we currently have in the county code to allow us to adjust the 17 tax rates, or excuse me, the 2017 prorated <coughs> tax amount, and as well as 2018, is the areas affected by the orange areas on the map. Everything else would need to be adjusted by way of proclamation. So what we're telling you right now is the areas that we're estimating. I don't have a proclamation yet. Yeah. Okay, they signed it this morning. That gives us the authority. So I need that in order for us to adjust because there's nothing in the county code that said I can go back in and adjust 2018 tax values. With that said, the anticipated area in Zone A would most likely all go to a zero value or zero tax amount. Now, there are people that do live on the Malka side of Leilani and they do feel like their property is still of value to them, but what we have to look at is what the open market, an informed buyer is willing to purchase your property for. And right now there's a lot of concern, um, even if you're slightly informed about purchasing a property in the area. If the lava happens to stop tomorrow, which could happen, if we're really lucky, it could stop tomorrow. It doesn't mean your value comes back right away. There's typically a two-year turnaround you see on that. In this area, we expect it to be a lot longer, and we can always adjust for 2019, which is on January 1st, 2019. Um, if I had to make a best estimate, I would say that the property has significantly lost value. As I stated yesterday, one of the newspapers said plummet. That wasn't quite the word that we used. Um, however, the values in the area have gone down. Now for the area in zone B, as of last week, we did take a look at it. Um, because of the lots of cancellations, excuse me, because of a lot of cancellations in the area which has a high vacation rental area, their values have dropped significantly and that's what a lot of people are investing in some of the property along the coastline there for. So our estimate for the taxes that we are potentially losing in 2018 takes a higher percentage in zone B. And it also takes consideration for the area in Zone C because they are greatly affected by the SO2. And now they are limited on their access routes because that one highway has been covered with lava. Now the last area is Zone D, which technically hasn't been necessarily directly affected. I don't know of too many that was as a result of evacuation. However, when you speak to the residents there, this is an area that we do know they're feeling the earthquakes. They're feeling, they can hear the noise. They can see the lava. When the wind shifts, they do have effects from the SO2. And on top of that, their agricultural area has definitely been affected. And so the total area, if we had to give you the range today that you're going to lose is approximately $3 million for 2018 in tax revenue lost. Fiscal year 19, tax year 18, sorry. Chair? I, I, yes, Councilman I, I, just, I, I heard that number, but do you have like square miles or acreage that these zones A, B, C, and D cover? Um, we don't necessarily go off of, we go off parcel counts, so I can tell you what our total parcel counts is. And we can definitely get you the square miles for all of the zones. I mean, the zones are really rough. They're, they're based on how we do our neighborhoods and how the values are affected um, in relationship to each other. Yeah, and if you don't have it now, that's fine. But I think for talking points, mm -hmm. you know, and we, we hear a lot of concern from the visitor industry, which Mr. Okabe spoke about. You know, if we could quantify this affects 10 square miles of 4,000 square miles of our islands in, so we can message better in our tourism piece. Mm -hmm. I think that would be very helpful. 
Well, I can go over the numbers I have, and hopefully the staff at Real Property are listening, and okay. they will be texting me that acreage real soon. That was a major hint in case they yeah. missed it. So Real but, Property, if you're listening. Yeah, get me the <laughs> acreage. But the total number of parcels is 12,247 parcels. And when you're looking at the total number of homeowners in that area, so the number of people claiming a homeowner exemption is 1,583. Just to put it in some perspective, um, we have number of parcels that have ag use. So these are the ones that have applied for ag use with us because that's come up before and that number is 429. We have a lot of statistics, but I realize those can be boring and may not be what you're interested in. Chair, may I? Councilmember O'Hara. Um, I really appreciate the work you're doing, Lisa, here. And um, But this is only one of the areas currently affected by volcanic. No, we don't, because the area we're focused on right now is the immediate impact and not necessarily from ash. Um, we can look at it a couple of different ways. I mean, the whole island is impacted. If I adjust the values on the whole island, you're just going to have to really increase all the tax rates. It doesn't really help the immediate area. Now, should the volcano explode, and I realize there's earthquakes affecting a lot of volcano, and I'm not downplaying that at all. It's just this area, because Airbnb and there's other factors with insurance that have been easier to quantify and justify going in and doing a proclamation for, we, we can point to other areas to do that. Otherwise, I mean, there's honestly people in West Hawaii that feel like they're being greatly affected. And if we start adjusting that, the tax rates are just, they're just gonna increase. So then there's no benefit really at the end of the day to the people in this immediate area. We will keep watching the market. I mean, I, I'm not saying we won't go there, but for purposes of today, we are focused on this area only. Okay, thank you. You wanna continue? Um, with the presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and just as a reminder, um, we are committed to the farmers, you know, that are impacted by ash and other things that, you know, they will not be rolled back as a violation of the egg program because of the ash or volcanic activity. Um, so, in just the last few weeks since May 3rd, um, the overtime for the first pay period of this month added up to $745,000. Um, that includes all of our departments, um, especially police, fire, and public works, um, parks and recreation, and then the other departments were smaller. Um, we have incurred 560000 in road repairs, and we've paid 65000 for security, shelter meals, and other things as well as other supplies and meals for people working was about $9,900. When we prepared this slide, we did not yet have the helicopter cost of flying um, either to do our um, routine searches or to actually help evacuate people as we did on that one day, which is another 20 some thousand dollars. So we're already at costs of $1.4 million. The road repairs are unknown um, if those would be ongoing costs. Um, it depends, you know, how the lava covers, covers other roads, if we'll continue to, you know, maintain those or have to actually build even additional roads for, um, to allow people access um, out of the area. So um, as Lisa said, you know, we expect the impact on revenues to be roughly $3 million for the coming year. If all the areas that were shaded um, lost complete value, then it would go up to $6 million. So our range is kind of three to six, but we do believe that three million is the more realistic number in that area. Based on my calculations, if we um, had to incur overtime of this amount every pay period for one year, um, and even if FEMA reimbursed us 75% of that, our costs are of the 25% share would still be a little over $4 million when you take into account security and other things, ongoing costs that we would have to pay. So one year would be roughly $4 million. So we're looking at an impact of $7 million to our budget, $3 million reduction in revenue, and roughly $4 million in cost. And the $4 million is probably on the low end, but of course we also don't know that it would last a full year. In 1955, I believe the eruption lasted 89 days. Um, we don't know how to estimate that. You know, this one um, is very active indeed. 
Um, plus, we also have the ash at the same time. Um, in the current fiscal year, we're kind of at the end of the fiscal year. We're asking departments to try and you know absorb as much of the cost as they can um, for what they're not able to absorb. We do have the disaster account in the general fund. Um, we have a disaster account in the highway fund. And then we have the disaster fund itself. So for the current fiscal year, we, um, we can cover costs. Um, for those of you that may or may not be familiar with FEMA, it's definitely a reimbursement basis. Um, we, it does require a 25% match. Um, not all calls, costs will be allowable, but hopefully many of them will. We have already gone through some training and will be going through additional training on their procurement requirements, which are new and very stringent. Um, but the biggest one is the delay in receiving reimbursement. So just to put it into perspective, some of you may remember the 2006 earthquake, the 6.2 that hit off Kona side. Um, we have not been reimbursed for everything from that disaster yet. They're still in the process of closing it out. Um, in addition, um, 2014, we had both the cell and the 2014 lava event. Um, we have been reimbursed for half. Um, that's their kind of their system. It flows through the state, and then we get reimbursed half kind of upfront or early on, and the other half is when they close out the um, project or the grant. And um, state is fairly short-staffed, and we, I have no idea. It could be several years before we get the remainder of that money. Um, there's at least 700000 that's owed us in that uh, disaster fund that we carry that receivable on, but there are other amounts recorded as a receivable in the highway fund um, and capital project fund, I believe. So um, it's a long, drawn-out process. We um, looked at a variety of options. Um, we may decide to do any one of these together as a group or to do a little bit from all of them. So we would need to cut um, at least $3 million just for our revenue shortfall um, and probably at least $4 million um, for the additional expenditures. So that would be like $7 million that we're looking for, basically. And... <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we had started to look at it when this first happened, and Leilani Estates and Laopuna Gardens were the area most impacted. We knew it was roughly 1.2 in revenue, so we had started to look for that amount. It would mean um, re reversing what we put in the May budget of 500,000 for the nonprofit grants, reducing miscellaneous claims and judgments by 100,000. Although I'm still not sure that's a wise idea. Um, taking away the council contingency funds that we just put back in, reducing R&D, ag, tourism, business development, um, eliminating the hazard mitigation project, and a lot of other little things that Nancy and our team were able to come up with. But that would give us only the $1.2 million. There's not a lot more to reduce. We could unfund funded positions, but as you know, um, every county employee is pretty much impacted by this um, disaster, um, whether it's police manning roadblocks, um, we have National Guard help, we have highways people out there. We have a lot of people out there, and I don't think this is the time to unfund positions or to do a RIF, which would be a reduction in force. Um, for those of you that may not be familiar with the reduction in force process, um, it requires 90-day advance notice, and you can pick the position that you plan on laying off, but they have the opportunity to apply for other positions within the county that they qualify for, and they would bump someone. And then that person that gets bumped has an opportunity to apply for other positions until you get all the way down to the lowest level person. So even though you thought that maybe you were going to lay off someone who's making $100,000 a year, by the time the process it is all done, you may end up only laying off a clerk that makes twenty-five to $30,000 a year. Um, in addition, that process usually takes up to a year because of all the bumping. And the person that you bumped gets red circled and they keep their pay. 
it's not a fun process. And, um, you know, the state went through it, and I think in the end they didn't really save anything. So it's definitely not something on our list of recommendations. It's more just to make everybody aware of what the process would be and the little, if anything, it would save us. Um, there is a section, um, I got asked about it yesterday, section um, 10-8, I believe it is, in the charter. It does allow for, um, yes, 10-8, supplemental and emergency appropriations. So I've seen this section before, and I've read it before. But, you know, I guess I never read all the way to the very bottom of the paragraph, that very last sentence that said, the total of emergency appropriations in any fiscal year shall not exceed one-half of 1% 1 of the total operating appropriations, excluding those for debt service. And so when you take our $518 million upcoming budget, less debt service, and you take a half percent of that, that's only $2.3 million. And you have to have a um, funding or revenue source. The budget still has to remain balanced. However, this um, section does allow us to borrow. Um, instead of borrowing from a bank, we would probably p to prefer to borrow from maybe one of our funds that had additional funding. It would take council action. Um, so let's say Ponk has probably the most money in it right now of our funds. Um, but also, the way the section's worded, we would have to repay that no later than July 1st, 2019, the beginning of the next fiscal year. And we would have to obviously take the action after July 1st of this current year. So why that's helpful, especially if this um, disaster continues on and we don't estimate correctly how much we need to save, um, you know, it, might, it may be helpful to us next year. It really just buys us a little bit of time, not a lot. Um, as I said yesterday, everything's on the table. It's to give everybody just an opportunity to see what the impact would be. Um, we ran numbers on if we were to adjust real property taxes, and we did a three, six, and nine million dollar impact. The three million would cover just the shortfall in revenue that we're losing from the Pune area. The six million would provide three million additional to help support the disaster costs. And nine was kind of a combination of if the all six million in Pune was lost plus additional expenses, um, that would be important as well. So if we had a um, $3 million revenue shortfall that we wanted to cover with increases in real property taxes, residential would go from 1110 to 1130, apartment from 1170 to 1190, and all the way down. We did impact every single classification evenly across the board because we are one island and one community and we felt that we should all pitch in to help everybody out together. Um, same thing for the $6 million scenario that you have before you. The rates would go from 1110 to 1145, 1170 to $12 for apartment, commercial 1070 to $11. And again, the numbers at the top are the total revenue that would generate both to help us make up for the shortfall in revenue that we're expecting um, from the loss of real property taxes in Pune, as well as to help cover costs. And the last one would be $9 million to generate, which means residential would go from a current rate of 1110, and it would go up to 1155. Apartments from 1170 would go to 1210, commercial from 1070 up to 1115. So these are to give you some options, you know, just to look at. Um, the next one um, is to look at um, and possibly get a reconsideration of the GE surcharge. Um, it would generate $25 million in fiscal year 19. Based on the final act signed by the governor, it would all have to um, go to transportation. That doesn't mean we couldn't lobby the legislature to um, make it use more usable for disaster-related um, monies as well. But um, some of our costs are definitely going to be road-related. Obviously, some of the roads covered by lava are county, some are state, and many are private. So um, one of the things we could also lobby the legislature for was to help with disaster-related private roads or something like that. You know, this is all just coming about in the last few weeks, so... Um, you know, it's not like we have all the answers of what exactly we would lobby for, but trying to think of all those possibilities. 
Um, it would free up four point six million in the general fund. That's the mass transit portion. That's not covered by um, grants. So that money could be moved over to that GE tax would cover that, and that would all free up four point six million either to help cover revenue shortfalls or to cover the disaster related expenses. And um, we do believe that it, um, the G surcharge could pay for a portion of our FEMA match. Anything related to what we currently spend in the highway fund, whether it's um, you know the emergency road work, their labor, but um, at least that portion we do believe would be able to cover it for that. Anything over and above what we need for that, um, as we've said before, the mayor is committed to having the GE um, surcharge, at least in the first year, go to help um, implement the mass transit master plan, um, as well as to do those other larger road projects that would not be covered by fuel tax. Um, if we have to wait to borrow money or get federal assistance for some of those larger road projects, they could take a long time to come. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I continue to be concerned about is our bond ratings. We've already received telephone calls from our bond rating agencies. Um, obviously, they're concerned about lava. Of course, we've tried to put in perspective for them that, you know, the portion of the island that's um, where the eruption is occurring versus the rest of the island. However, the impact on tourism is definitely going to impact our bond ratings at some point. One of the things the bond raters look at is our... Um, our reserves, basically, what our fund balance is, what our budget stabilization fund is, what our disaster fund is. And yes, we have prepared for the future. And yes, we have a budget stabilization fund. And yes, we have a um, disaster fund. But we cannot deplete those down to zero. Um, as you know, our island is one of the most disaster-prone islands. We have had more FEMA events than any other county. Um, I remember the 2000 floods, the 2006 earthquake, the 2011 tsunami, the 2014 hurricane, the 2014 lava, and now the 2018 lava event. And those are just in my career with the county, you know, many others. There's also been several fire, FEMA fire events and whatnot as well. So we need to be prepared for the future as well. We can't eliminate all of our reserves in one year. That's not going to put us in a good place financially, um, not to mention hurricane season starts on June 1st of this year. Um, I'm just trying to be realistic, sorry. Um, our budget stabilization fund in the county code does set a target amount of 5 to 15 percent of general fund total expenditures. We are at um, 5 percent right now, so we do want to be cautious. Um, our fund balance probably will take a little bit of hit because of the expenditures we're incurring in overtime and whatnot right now. So um, we're not expecting that you know, to go up in any way. Um, that's all we had in this part of the presentation. Um, we're happy to answer any questions you have. Um, we did, I spent a lot of time as well as our staff yesterday with Corporation Council looking at a lot of alternatives um, and what might be helpful, many of which I uh, mentioned in here. But if you have questions, we're more than happy to help answer them. Okay. Council Member O'Hara. Um, you mentioned, Deanna, you mentioned the, um, the emergency um, funding that we could pursue, it was $2.3 million or something? Um, if we were to do an emergency appropriation, it would be $2.3 million. We currently have $6 million in the disaster fund. Of course, 700000 or a little more of that is a receivable from FEMA, so there's really about $5.3 in cash there okay. um, as of the beginning of this month. Um, I'm wondering what it's going to take to potentially repurpose the uh, geothermal funds. Maybe Mr. Yee needs to be involved in this discussion mm -hmm. um, because um, some of these impacts, uh, I, I have to say, um, in terms of people um, reluctant to move back and, and decline in property tax revenues is related to what that situation has contributed mm -hmm. to the natural disaster. So we do have two geothermal funds, and I'm happy if Mr. Yee would like to come forward. Um, the first one is the Community Benefit and Relocation Fund. Mm -hmm. And so that one is um, where we would buy out people's property that live in the geothermal zone. We have bought out um, several parcels already. Um, 
it's based kind of on the um, assessed value. So I'm not sure how that would work going forward. Well, my concern here is uh, up until, well, it, it, this initiated as a volcanic event, which wouldn't have triggered any usage of the geothermal funds, but um, it has since evolved into a complicated mess. Um, and we are sitting on, I believe, Deanna, you can verify about a total of close to $7 million of unexpended funds. I know there's a $1 million cap on the relocation. And, and it's questionable if this will ever resume uh, activity in that location. Very questionable. So I have about four million in the geothermal relocation and community benefit fund, and about two million in the geothermal asset fund. Okay. But those were very quick calculations I did last night. Yeah, um, and I've done some previously too. It's actually a little more than four in the relocation, but we we have rules in place as to how we can potentially use that, and so it's going to take uh, action if we want to repurpose that. But um, I just wanted to bring that into play. What do you think, Mr. Yee? Michael Yee, Planning Director. Uh, I think, like you said, there are things in place right now that would probably prevent us from just outright using the funds for a volcanic event. However, I think as we've tried to consider how we can rewrite some of the criteria for using those funds, I think obviously if folks want to bring that forth, we should certainly consider that. When we looked with Corporation Council last night, um, the community benefit portion of the fund, I believe civil um, defense is one of the allowed um, purposes of that. Absolutely. So, yeah. As is uh, land acquisition, mm -hmm. and we may need to be replacing um, farmers. Um, right. I'm already in discussion with the state on this. Um, because we do have a lot of large tracts of state ag land, and we had a meeting last night with the Department of Ag Deputy Director and USDA, and it wasn't well publicized, so we didn't have that many farmers. But right now, um, they're not even aware. They're not been told yet whether they've lost the land that they are using and if um, it's just loss of crop or if it's actual loss of land. So we're still in the dark on a lot of that. Um, are you done? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. I, I thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Leloy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Deanna, for all these different options and scenarios. My first question is to option I guess option one or one, two, three, four. Is is this a comprehensive option or do we we can cherry pick something out of one? Yeah, it's meant to be two. these are all options that we can implement even all together, you know, some of each one. Um, we were not able to come up with $7 million in expense reductions. Too many of our um, expenditures are mandated by state law. Um, nor do we think it would be the wisest thing to do given the situation we're in. In addition, you know, um, borrowing from Punk is probably not something we would do right now as we develop the budget. It would probably be something we would save for next fiscal year when we're in the budget and maybe we didn't budget enough. Maybe the disaster got heaven forbid, bigger or cost us more than we anticipated. Um, and then doing the real property tax rates, you know, we only get one opportunity each year to set those. So same thing, I mean, maybe, you know, why we realize probably $3 million is what we probably are going to take a hit on. You know, there's also additional costs, but that may not be the only way people want to fix it. And then um, GE tax, um, you know, so it could be a smorgasbord of things, yes. So let's talk about that smorgasbord a little bit because clearly there's some timing elements related mm -hmm. to those options, right? So what I just heard you say is if we consider some of these options, 
for example, the real property tax increase, not that anybody's interested in any of that right now, right. that's going to sunset rather quickly here. Correct. So that option will quickly get taken off the table. Mm-hmm. Right. Rates have to be set no later than June 20th. Okay. So June 20th. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, for the GE tax to work, we would have to um, implement that by June 30th. For that to be effective for the coming fiscal year, anything after June 30th, it would not be effective till fiscal year 20. So from a timing perspective, the real property tax and the GE has the closest sunset or deadlines that we would have to if we use those options. Right. And then after that, it would be the borrow from the punk fund or reduce um, expenditures. Expenditures. Or, right. We, I, trying to balance everything, um, the needs of Puna, our financial situation, our bond ratings, I think we want to take some action to generate additional revenue or reduce expenditures now as we adopt the budget and save like the borrowing from Punk and those things um, if the emergency gets larger in the future. And I just, um, why people are thinking about things, the total acreage, and I believe this is all four shaded areas, is 55,000 acres, or 2.1% of our island that's being impacted by the um, lava right now. And we thank our real property tax for staff for catching the hint and um, getting those to us so quickly. <laughs> uh, I'm going to yield at this time. Thank you. Uh, Council Member EF, did you had your light on earlier. Did you want to? Well, well I think um, Deanna Richard. just pretty much answered my question okay. because I, um, I was wondering um, priority wise whether it's better for us to look. I didn't know realize that we could borrow from other funds. Mm-hmm. Um, Right, and that's um, it's one of those cases in the charter that I believe is set up so that if something does happen, we have an opportunity. I don't believe it's meant to be, you know, the, our first option, but definitely, you know, if things happen, I mean, a lot of our um, the disaster fund, the budget stabilization fund, this um, emergency appropriations, they're all set up in cases of true emergency if something were to happen during the fiscal year. In some ways. Um, we're fortunate that we have the opportunity to mend the budget that's coming up, um, you know, to try to take, you know, that into account. But um, none of these are easy decisions, as I said yesterday. I think my, my other question was regarding the um, the emergency or the, our disaster fund. And so um, you didn't want to borrow from that to the point of it We will be zero. using... But right, we will be using some of that this year, as I um, mentioned yesterday, and I guess probably not everybody was tuning in, but you know, we have not written any of the project worksheets with FEMA yet. They've been on site, they've been very helpful, we've gotten them to approve projects before we started them, but we haven't actually written out what they call the project worksheets where they actually obligate the funds to us. And so probably at the end of the month we'll start that process. We have somebody coming out tomorrow that I hope to get more information on that. So right now, we have to fund basically all the costs of related to that. So the $1.4 million in costs that we've incurred to date, some will be coming from highway fund, but um, the 700 and some thousand that we've already spent from general fund, we may not have adequate appropriations to cover that, so we will have to use part of the disaster fund even in the current fiscal year just to cover those costs. And when we do receive the reimbursements for the previous um, events that you mentioned, mm-hmm. the earthquake and tsunami and Izel, et cetera, mm-hmm. do those go straight into the same disaster fund? Um, yes, the, the receivable is set up in the fund in which the expenditures <laughs> were incurred. So if we spent the money out of disaster fund, then yes, it goes back into that fund. Are we expecting any other reimbursements to come in there, the ones that are still due? Um, I'm, I'm expecting all of them to come in. I just, I doubt, highly doubt if it will be this fiscal year. They are that far behind. And there's not a way to get that information? If the state could get more staff, then they probably could look at our information more quickly. Hmm. They've had it a seems l- like that would help us a lot. 
they've had an unfortunate series of events, including some of their personnel passing away. Mm -hmm. So every time somebody starts on it and gets down the road of reviewing our expenditures, something happens and we have to have a new person start looking at it again. So it has been a very long, drawn out process. Yeah, seems obvious that that would be the first place to be able to. Um, you but know, you know the balance. The balance that I gave you of the six million dollars includes those receivables from FEMA, so we've already taken that into account. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Councilmember Richards. Thank you, Chair, and Deanna. Thank you for promising a interesting conversation today, and mm -hmm. you guys did deliver. Also, thank you to Real Property for taking the hint for the information. Um, what we're talking about, and I, I think your fiscal thought process is real sound as far as not wanting to touch any of those funds because we're talking about cash flow management and the liquidity of the county. And so leaving that available to us if we get real stuck is, is probably the best way. Um, the projects that you're talking about for FEMA and conceptually, yeah, go ahead. We haven't done the paperwork yet. What kind of cash liability are we looking at there for the short term, say the next 90 days? Just, and again, off the top of your head, I realize. No, so um, based that, um, we spent 745000 just in overtime. And if I add in the security and other recurring costs, if we say it's about 800000 for one pay period, that would be $1.6 million per month. So for 90 days, that would be $1.6 million times three or roughly $4.8 million, okay. of which I would expect to get 75% back. At some point. Yeah, at some point, at some yeah. Point, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, which comes back to the trying to figure out how to manage the cash flow going forward. And so, you know, in terms of liquidity, I have already talked to our treasurer, and he's keeping everything short term. You know, normally um, this coming July, when the first installments of real property tax would come in, we would invest some of that a little bit longer term, three, four months out. But we're going to keep everything liquid because we're unsure of the timing of some of the reimbursements. In addition, we've been very thankful that, you know, both our federal um, legislators and our state legislators have been out here to look to see how they might be able to help. But none of that is for sure yet. You know, I am aware Kauai received some assistance after their flood from the state, but I really don't know in what terms that is. You know, we're appreciative of the state providing, like, you know, their National Guard and other um, helpers as well. And you could actually see the end of that flood coming, this one. Yeah. This is one of... Um, this is the most unique disaster I've been involved with um, since I've been at the county. You know, when we had the 2000 flood, um, the rain came, it ended, we fixed things. Same thing with the earthquake. It came, it ended, we fixed things. Um, all the disasters have been like that. The 2014 lava was a little bit different. It started more upslope. It um, crawled down the hill. Um, it did take a structure. You know, um, it was very scary for the people of Pahoa. We didn't know where it was going. But it was a much more slower moving lava. This, I cannot even imagine what some of those residents in that area are going through with not knowing where the next fissure will appear, not knowing where the lava is going to flow. This is very scary um, for anybody down there, and we don't know when it's going to stop. You know, and this is the first time since the last ash eruption was 1924, I believe, to have both of them occurring at the same time. Um, you know, as Dr. Jim says, we're in unprecedented times. You know, we've never had an eruption like this before. So we don't have a lot of information to go on. We're hopeful it is like 1955 and it's only 89 days, but time will tell and we really have no way of knowing. Okay, so um, we have a five, 518 budget in front of us with the reduction, projected redu reduction in income stream, projected increases in expenditures. Uh, our target is somewhere around $7 million. We, um, I would be most comfortable if we somehow generated $7 million. Part of that $7 million would, um, $3 million of it would go to replace the expected reduction in our property taxes. So basically, I'm saying we over budgeted, you know, our revenue for real property taxes by three million, and we need to reduce it. 
and then part of it go, I would suggest go directly to the disaster fund so that we can um, cover the expenses related to the lava no matter which fund they're actually incurred in. Um, let's say we budget seven million for next fiscal year. And let's say this, um, we raise, I'm just gonna pick one, but let's say we do it by raising our property taxes. If um, the event ended maybe midway through the year, and so the expense portion, let's say, we didn't use all of it, um, it would go to fund balance, which would then be able to be utilized in the future year to potentially reduce the rates if needed. The other thing is, you know, we're at the beginning of this disaster. We don't know yet what the impact on tourism will be. Um, I don't know yet what the impact on the values will be for fiscal year 2019. Many of the hotels, you know, um, would prefer we use an income-based approach on setting their values, and if they're empty, you know, that's going to have a significant effect as well. To clarify, seven million, uh, and that's a combination of either increasing revenue or decreasing expenses. It could be a somehow combination finding of the two. seven million dollars. Yes. Okay. All right. At this point, I yield. Councilmember Ruggles. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Diana. I can tell this has been a lot of work, just in a very short amount of time. Yeah, I really appreciate all the awesome staff I have, yes. <laughs> um, so currently, I, so I, I'm, let's see, <laughs> I just have so many questions. Oh, the, the, the Community Benefit Fund, what is the balance for that? It's roughly $4 million, just a second. Okay, um, and as far as the disaster fund, you said that there was five point three million in it currently. Um, of cash, yes, of spendable cash. Okay, of spendable, and what is the total? Um, the fund has six million dollars in it, but seven hundred thousand ish is a receivable from FEMA. Okay, I see. Thank you. Um, have we yet used any funds from this disaster fund? for this event? Um, we did back in 2014 for a cell and the um, 2014 lava, um, most of which was reimbursed by FEMA. Okay, great. Um, do you know how much we used? Um, no, I don't have that with me, but um, we can calculate that. Okay, um, and what do you feel would be the max that we could use from this disaster fund? You know, um, the whole idea when the disaster fund was first set up was to have that um, safety net. What happened in 2000 is we didn't have a disaster fund, so we had the flooding, we had a lot of infrastructure repairs that needed to be made, and so we didn't have a source of funds to really fix those. We were fortunate that year that I believe we had excess fund balance that they were able to appropriate. But other than that, they would have had to probably borrow and do bond money. We cannot use bond money for operating costs, and a lot of our costs for this disaster are actually overtime and operating costs. So we want to have at least you know several million to carry forward for the next time, because we do have to front the money. Even though we get FEMA assistance, we always have to front that money till they reimburse us. And so by having the five to six million dollars in there at all times, you know I think the goal in the um, county code is to have it reach ten million. But by keeping that five or six million, that means we'll have the cash to kind of front for the next disaster. Right. I'm. I'm wondering how much, if at all, would you feel comfortable taking from this fund? Um, I, what we are taking right now is, you know, whatever it's going to take us to get through the end of the fiscal year because, you know, the 250 disaster account in the general fund is not going very far for this disaster. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably be using part of it, but then, like I said, we do hope to be reimbursed by FEMA. Okay, um, and in option one, it's one of the expenses that was proposed to cut was reduced R&D, ag, tourism, promotion, and business development. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what that number would be? Yeah, you know, I think, um, I'm hoping Nancy Kelly's bringing up her sheet. Um, I left that on my desk, but it was like, you know, 10,000 here and 20,000 there. 
you know, um, one of the things we're realizing is that we can't really cut tourism. We can't really cut egg promotion. Our farmers and our businesses need that money more now than ever. We definitely got to do something to, you know, kick and gear our economy for this coming year. We already have people, you know, thinking that the whole island impact is impacted and not to mention the whole state. So now that we know it really is only 2.1% of our island, you know, it does help to tell that story. Yeah, it was 45000 in total across all of those areas. And again, we started working on that a little while ago when we thought we just had to find $1.2 million. And before we started realizing, you know, the true impact it's having on egg and the true impact it's having on our tourism. all the questions I have. I think that we have a good variety of options here that we should, that we can start exploring. Um, I'll yield at this time. Thank you. Council Member Chung. Yeah. Hi, Deanna. Yeah. Uh, you know, you did uh, touch upon this subject and uh, my question may have been asked and answered, but you know, we're all reeling, so. We are, yes. So uh, I, I, I apologize totally if, it, if it was. But you know, I'm talking. I'm, I'm, I want to ask a question about this emergency ordinance in Section 3-11. You talked about it, as well as it relates to Section 10-8, appropriations and supplemental emergency. Um, what would be the purposes of an emergency ordinance? Is it only to appropriate? monies under an emergency or are there other applications for this or and to borrow um there probably are other applications especially if you know um life health and safety are impacted um however they're not to be used to levy taxes which is why we have only that one um, opportunity to set the real property tax rates um by june 20th um they um, may not be used to authorize borrowing or grant and renew on these particular emergency ordinances. So the emergency appropriations are the ones under 10-8. Um, Joe may have other ideas, but I think, you know, emergency ordinances have been um, utilized before, but in terms of money itself, it's limited to that $2.3 based on our current numbers right. in our I budget. I mean, because it's, it's kind of a uh, strangely worded Mm -hmm. A charter provision, this emergency is, ordinance, yeah. ordinances. It tells mm -hmm. us what we can't do, and right. it refers us to a different section relating to appropriations. Right. But I'm just wondering if there's anything else out there, and probably not, right? Because it's no, um, not explicit. Right, right. Um, there's not a whole lot of other options. Um, we've been you know, really thinking about it since May 3rd and trying to go through and determine you know, what all of our options are. Um, if this is a short event, then yeah, we might be okay, but you know, there's no signs of it stopping is the problem right now. Then I have a question of our county clerk. Um, you know, our, the deadline for submission of charter amendment proposals was in early May. But what if we utilize this emergency ordinance provision to fast track charter? amendments, because it's only one reading, would that be possible? Um, I'm, I'm not really sure if that would be possible or not. Um, so the emergency ordinance would only require one reading as opposed to the three readings. Right. Yeah. If we could do that, certainly we could we could get it in in time because um, we would have enough time still. Or then my my other question would be to the chair, because we need three readings, but you know, given the exig exigent circumstances that we're faced with, and you know, I'm sure many of us have ideas of, you know, what we could do within the context of the charter. I'm just wondering, okay, we need three readings. We're already behind if we go on our regularly scheduled rota. But would it be possible now for us to have a right. special meeting? And can I call up um, our corp counsel, Joe?
so I don't mind doing the extra meetings. I just need to know if we're going to be um, okay with that. Okay, um, you know that's a good question. And um, actually, a, a similar question came up previously on, on something else. And my answer to that can be no. Um, when 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 you look at the charter, it's basically um, as a form of the government. And so, what, what question are you asking? Uh, answering first of all, it's it's fast tracking the uh, charter, um, charter amendment through the emergency. Yeah. Okay. Never mind that. Oh, okay. Let's just go with the three readings. Let's try to be real safe about this. Okay. So that's that's a different question. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So, so can we look at maybe the dates? Yeah. So we have you know we have to have three readings, right? right? I mean, I, this is actually the chair's question, but yeah. you know we have to have three readings, but. Does it have to be on regularly scheduled meeting dates, or can we go uh, second, uh, first Wednesday of June, sec second Wednesday of June, and third, uh, and, oh, well, no, second, third, and fourth special meeting? Can it be done? Can the three uh, readings be done? with a special uh, meeting, as long as notice is given, proper notice and everything. Exactly. No problem. Yeah, you know, as long as uh, proper proper notice has been given, you know, you can always do a special uh, meeting. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's the yeah, question. Yeah. Never mind about the fast tracking part. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Joe. That's all I have. Go ahead. Um, can I just add one thing? Um, as a reminder also, um, when it comes to revenues and just as you're considering all the options, um, as a reminder, the state legislature did vote to put on the ballot this year the um, cert borough property tax surcharge for um, investment property um, to be used for education. And we are not sure yet the impact that's going to have on us in the future. As you know, we try to tax those same properties. Which is one of the reasons we would like to, at some point at least, um, you know, make our revenue stream more diversified. Okay. Um, I just got to ask, Ms. Uh, <coughs> Council Member Chung must have been done. Okay, so um, Council Member Leloy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, since we're kind of looking at a smorgasbord and possible charter amendments, I'm looking at Section 10-12 Special Fund. Upon recommendation of the mayor, the council may by ordinance abolish or establish special funds that may be necessary for the proper and efficient segregation of fiscal operations of the county. So when I look at our budget, we have the beautification fund, we have um, the bikeway fund. Are these other funds that we could maybe shift to help? with um, some, of the, some of the shortfalls, but would still track. require some, just and I'm not looking to abolish them, but maybe sus no, right, suspend just them. Suspend them. Um, Joe probably could speak to it better. Some of those funds are actually um, established by HRS, and so our, um, the governor's proclamation may impact those, but probably not the mayor's proclamation. Yeah, Mr. Kamelema, I mean, if we're going to look at all options, and I appreciate everything Deanna put together and her team, and they're all really smart, but, I mean, we might as well try everything and see what we can get. I mean, what yeah, I'm hearing is we're looking at $7 million and possibly growing, um, and we might need more than just a, an amendment to borrow from the punk fund or disc you know, reduce right. expenses. And then just to put it into perspective, Bikeway Fund has 650000 and Beautification Fund has about the same amount. So a 1.2, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So uh, uh, this is Joseph Kamala Mello. Anyway, so I do agree with, with the statement made by the finance director. You know, so we, we have to look at, you know, the, the state laws. Yeah, could you follow up and provide that? Uh, in, you know, feedback to us because if we're gonna try and do some amendments or work within the confines of our charter, but use some emergency relief provisions, I want to be able to use 
everything we can. Um, and again, I appreciate what the finance department is exploring, but I think we can explore a little more. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, that, that's my point. Uh, I yield. Okay. Councilmember Richards, you had your light on. Then I'll go to Councilmember Eof. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Uh, a couple of questions, Dan. I don't know if you even have this information available to you at the moment, but uh, you know, we talked about the seven million dollar number. And uh, have you looked at budget reductions as far as where we can cut expenses? First question. We did. In option one, um, you know, that total that we came up with was $1.2 million. Okay. Um, comment on some of the cuts. Given where we are with our tourism, um, and this is just editorialized, I don't think cutting the tourism promotion right. budget is a, that a good too, idea. Yes. Right. Yeah. So if we took out that, I mean, we'd be at I mean, roughly a million dollars, okay. you know, yeah. And then um, just looking back, um, I'm constantly looking back at our history. I know Kalapana went through an event back in the 80s, early 90s, if I recall right, and I was trying to look it up. Uh, how did the county, what time of year did that start, and how did the county manage that? Um, and I'm, what I'm looking for is... Uh, relative numbers that they dealt with as far as finances and then maybe there's some things that we don't need to reinvent that were already tackled at that point we can go back and check but one of the things about that event was it covered a period of almost 20 years i think it um when it first started it took out some homes and then i think it was staggered over numerous years so I believe the disaster section of the real property tax code has been in there for a long time, so helping individual owners. Um, and then, but this kind of impact in terms of having the eruption along the rift zone and being in a neighborhood, I don't think it's like that. I think all the other flows have come down um, towards the, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get that point. Um, Leilani is... I'm, well, I think all of these things have their own unique aspects yeah. of it. I'm trying to see if there's just portions of it. No, I agree, and we're all about not recreating the will, but right. we did contact um, one of our uh, former real property tax administrators who's been here since um, 1980, you know, when mm -hmm. real property tax came over from the state, and even he doesn't remember it having such a large impact. I think it was just a few properties at a time. If I could ask, could we get a history of the real property tax annually for the last, well, since maybe since back to 1980, if we can look at that, then maybe correlate it to the um, anything that was going on at the time. And again, just, I don't know if that give us any answers, but it's more information. I yield. Are you yielding? Are you yielding? Okay. Thank you. Um, Council Member Yoff. Oh, wait, hang on one second. Um, Council Member David never had a chance to speak even in the first round, so I'm going to allow Council Member David if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms. Sacco, I just had earlier you said that given our situation, between three and seven million would be um, the number we're looking for, about anywhere from three, okay. Yes, three to seven. Yeah. So And again, three million is what we do expect real property tax um, lost revenue and four million would be to cover a year's worth a year's of worth overtime right, and costs. For the overtime. And, and just so, our twenty five percent. Right. And given the discussion we've been having about potentially reducing borrowing from Pong, if um, if what you're saying the one point two reduction in your reduced expenses, you know, the, the amounts that was put back into our contingencies yeah. on your PowerPoint that mm -hmm. you said total 1.2. Then we're talking about possibly the bikeway and beautification fund around mm -hmm. 1.3. And then maybe emergency borrowing from Punk maximum is 1.2 million. 
uh, 2.3 million. 2.3 million. But we would have to wait oh. to do that till next fiscal year because, and that, that would have to be repaid back. And right. I think even using some of these special funds, they may also have to be repaid back. We would have to look at that more carefully, and I believe that's what Mr. Kamalamela is looking at now. Right, and if and if he could also, co even though there's a repayment, because maybe could we extend that repayment um, timeline if we have to, given that this is an emergency situation um, down, the down the road? Why, well, I, I fully understand what you're saying, <laughs> and I um, agree. Um, one of the things I have been told is because that's in the charter that that does not get overridden with the disaster proclamation. Things in the county code can, but not the charter requirements. And that's where maybe a charter amendment would come in. Right. Um, okay, and then, so if we eliminate that, and then the potential for the tourism, um, that makes it one, two, three, three point five. Mm -hmm. without the punk um mm -hmm. but we're still looking for the total the best the best scenario yeah. okay um all right i just wanted to mm -hmm. keep thinking and you know my feeling was that we probably need to adjust the budget by the 7 million now yeah. and then the 2.3 million that we'd be allowed to do under the disaster or emergency section mm -hmm. would actually have to be utilized next year in case the costs even go higher I mean, I think that's the unfortunate thing about this event. We're not sure what's going to happen yet. Mm -hmm. So, but we're definitely appreciative of the things we do have in place, like the fuel tax and whatnot, that we can utilize that for roads and the emergency and clearing out Government Beach Road and allowing people to evacuate when necessary. I see. Okay, for now, I, I yield for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Council Member Yoff. Thank you. Yeah, my. Um, thinking was kind of along the same lines as Ms. Leloy and Ms. David because there's so many moving parts, but there's some things that we can be assured of, like where we are allowed by disaster mechanisms to borrow or even to... to so the the um, the timing is also something that you're, you're phasing in the need. Mm -hmm. So as, you know, even if we were to consider a charter amendment, even that would put the ability to access that extra money would be way down the line too. Plus there's an uncertainty about the voters um, right. passing a charter amendment. And you know, as um, I, I've read the charter many times, but yesterday with much more detail probably than in the past. And um, one of the things I did realize is the charter is really set up to protect the public and our voters and that not to put them in a precarious situation. So even if we were to borrow, having to pay back by July 1st of the following fiscal year is really to protect them from digging ourselves into too big a hole that they would have to make up through like real property tax increases in the future. And so um, I applaud those who really you know, have created the charter over the years and um, it really was set up to protect the taxpayers. And why we want to look at all possibilities, I think um, Joe can help us determine which funds would have to be paid back. Let's say he determines bikeway fund, we can utilize that now, but we would have to pay it back. Um, those are going to be the key factors here because, um, you know, if we can utilize some of them, great. Other ones, maybe not. But um, making sure we do pay back as mandated by the charter. And you know we're not trying to put anyone in a t in this situation. You know none of us could foresee this. You know disaster coming. It. You know um, yes we have hurricane season, but we don't have lava season. You know <laughs> it's not. Yeah yeah it's all the time. You're right. I mean it's just you know Kilauea has been erupting since 1983, and I still remember the article my mom sent me when I was in college. You know and. Um, so it's a long time event. Sometimes it's more active than others. Oh, did you want to add something? Because I did add a different question after that. I, if I can just briefly, I'm Nancy Crawford, Deputy Finance Director. And I just, I know you're all very well aware of this, but I just thought it bears repeating that while we are looking at sort of immediate costs and immediate reductions in real property tax revenue, this is not the revenue side of it. We may, it may end and we may be able to cover all the expenditures, but the revenue side of it is not short term. This is a long term effect, uh, certainly on the lower Puna area and 
likely on Ka'u area. And as Deanna mentioned before, given revenue losses to individual businesses and the resorts, uh, what we're you know planning ahead for the next fiscal year's values and the year after that and probably after that, I don't. I think it's hard for any of us to imagine a very quick rebound in property values here. So I just thought that I would mention that again for the benefit of everyone that this is that we're trying to look at something short term here, but it really is going to pay back is going to be difficult going forward. Thank you. Okay. And could you just, um, I know you've explained this before, but it's still a little bit um, unclear to me is the uses of the geothermal funds, the two accounts, and, and is any of that money available? Huh. Um, Mr. Yu, I'm sure will correct me if I'm wrong. So there's two funds. One is the Relocation and Community Benefit Fund, and initially it was just for relocation. And both of these were set up, I believe, with the license that um, for the geothermal site PGV. And the, so initially it was to relocate people within that area, should they so choose, because we weren't um, sure, I guess, of the impacts possibly of having the geothermal in the area. So you could put yourself on a list and we would buy your property and then we'd sell it to get more money to buy more properties. At some point in time, um, probably about 10 years ago, we created the community benefit portion. And that was to be able to do road work and whatnot because there had been some money that was accumulating in the fund. And one of the purposes that was added was the um, civil defense aspect as well. Hopefully I left that on top. And so the purpose, um, that fund can be used for um, relocation expenses, um, including, you know, like the appraisals and all of that. But then um, in addition for road improvements, water infrastructure, land acquisition, parks and recreational facility needs, civil defense, and mass transit improvements. And it's specified for lower Puna area and it's defined in here. Um, I believe the um, planning director is the one that approves those expenses um, before or approves the allowable expenditure before we spend it. Then there's also the asset fund, the geothermal asset fund. And that one, I believe, was set up so should there be some kind of accident or other something happened at the site that those funds could be used to whether it's to help evacuate the area or clean up or anything like that. So those are kind of the two different funds and kind of the main purposes. And so there's a little over four million in the community benefit and relocation fund. And then there's about two million in the asset fund, I believe. So those aren't really available to us in this situation for any? Um, I think the community benefit portion would of be. the um, would be, you know, for civil defense. But um, I'm not sure if there are people who would try to get us to repurchase the home. I'm a little confused. I don't have the planning director's rules in front of me in terms of how we set the price, but it is um, based on assessed value of which those values would be being reduced right now. Thank you. So, um, Madam Chair, can Ms. Um, O'Hara chime in? I think she wants to. Uh, is it? Just, um, just to add to Deanna's explanation, um, with the geothermal asset fund, which is there to mitigate the negative impacts of geothermal, it also, the rules require that it be approved through the commission. So it's a, a little bit lengthier process than the relocation and community benefit fund, which is approved by the director and the changes in budget come through us. Okay. Thank you. Are, are you, are you done? Okay, Council Member Ruggles. Thank you. I'm, I'm coming up with a lot of different ideas here, and I'm wondering what the process is for proposing these ideas. In funding or? In, in making up for the three million reduction in revenue for real property. Do you want to just talk about it and, uh, you know, and, because I, I, I don't know where you're going with this yet, or if mm -hmm. you're going to be proposing amendments, or if you want to ask the director if some of your ideas would work. Okay, great. Um, so just off the top of my head, it looks like we have six million dollars in the disaster fund, with the seven hundred thousand receivable. Um, my initial thought was. I mean, I'm, when I asked you about the disaster fund, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting an answer as far as how much you think would be available for us to use now. Okay, so what I, 
Um, I think I did answer, and that we have six million in the fund, but only five point three million cash, and um, it was one point six million or so in ongoing expenditures per month. So we'd be at four point eight million in three months, and I don't know when we'd get FEMA reimbursed. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of looking at it that that you know even just from this fiscal year, May and June expenditures that we're incurring it could kind of wipe out the fund already. There would be little left till we got reimbursed by FEMA. But ongoing, we want to keep at least five to six million in there because that is kind of our cost or our fund to kind of front the cost because every disaster is like this. We incur the money or incur the cost and then FEMA reimburses us at a later date and only 75% is reimbursed. So I'm kind of looking at there's not a lot in the disaster fund right now beyond this fiscal year until we get reimbursed by FEMA. Okay, so would you say that there's is there any that we could use in the disaster in the, in the disaster fund for well, this disaster? There's five. Well, we are. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is right now in this fiscal year. So one of the things to try and clarify is we still May and June of this year are still in fiscal year 18, in which we only budgeted 250 thousand in our general fund disaster account. Um, we still have to pay for the costs in this fiscal year, and the and the disaster fund is going towards that. So now we're, the budget before you is actual for this upcoming fiscal year, which starts on July 1, so the fiscal year 19 budget. And I don't think we're going to have anything left in the disaster fund for fiscal year 19 until at some point when we get reimbursed by FEMA. Okay, so the, the $5.3 million that's in there now is going to be gone by next fiscal year. It's um, very likely, but you know... De it depends on the actions that are needed, and that's the difficult part for me. You know, and then once we get confirmation from FEMA that they'll be reimbursing us, and we'll get hopefully our first half portion of that, that will restore some dollars in there. But I have no idea on the timing, and what I've been trying to explain as well is FEMA keeps changing their rules, and their procurement guidelines are very stringent now, and we're having a special training tomorrow. So even though we typically expect to get 75% back, it's not guaranteed because of their new rules as well. Okay, and so for the expenses that you just... Um, you said the overall impact of the budget, $3 million reduction in RPT revenue mm -hmm. and $4 million increase in cost. Right. Does that current fund in the, in the disaster fund help cover the $4 million increase in cost? Well, because um, the $4 million was calculated as roughly 800000 in ongoing costs per pay period. Um, not only employee costs, but also things like security and food and things like that. So that would be um, 1.6 million per month. And so when we did it last night, I looked at that 4 million is actually only our share or the 25%. But you know, w you know, it's a new event and we are um, having you know, new costs all the time, but if we did times 12 times 0.25, you know, our costs, if it was really 1.6 per month, I had based it on a little bit lower number, um, our 25% share would be 4.8. And so when I did it last night, I was assuming the 4 million cost is just our 25% share of this disaster. Okay. That, you know, we would be getting reimbursed by FEMA for the rest of it. You know, of course, we have no idea how long this um, event will continue. Um, not to mention, even if the lava stopped, I don't know how long it would take for the gases and other things to stop or when the ash would stop. I mean, there's a lot of different things going on in this one. It's a much different disaster than we've had before. Okay, so just to be clear, as far as the disaster fund applies to this $7 million deficit we're trying to make up to, um, those funds are not available to us. Right. I believe we're going to go through those pretty much all this fiscal year. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, that changes everything. <laughs> um, I think that... We're not in an easy situation, and I tried really hard to say that yesterday. <laughs> I think that utilizing the geothermal funds is a good idea, um, simply because after this, 
after this event, it's not smart of us to continue geothermal down there. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's just nonsensical. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. I don't have the authority to even make that decision. Uh, but I, I personally think that using the geothermal funds for this would be appropriate. Um, there's also, and this is what I'm talking about, the, the community benefit fund, not the asset fund. Just like the four million. Yeah. Um, then the <laughs> borrowing from Ponk or or the bikeway fund, I think, is also a good options. I understand now that we, I mean, for the time being, when I first heard that the options of the general excise tax and the real property tax, I personally would like to do everything we can to not have to increase taxes. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can borrow or use geothermal use Ponk funds, use the bikeway fund, instead of increasing taxes, I think we should go that way. Okay, um, so just um, not to interrupt you, but I just want to be sure we're all on the same page, is that why I totally agree borrowing would get us through, it would only really kick the can down the road because we have to repay them by July 1st, 2019, which would be fiscal year 20. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is by raising some kind of tax or some kind of revenue. And as we've been trying to explain is we believe this will be a slow recovery in real property tax values as well. So Thank just, you, yeah, just to clarify. That's where I was going. Okay. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so with that, I think looking back on different scenarios that can help protect people who are most vulnerable to tax increases um, is a good option. I'll, I'll yield at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um. Oh, yeah. <coughs> I just wanted to say, because, you know, this is going to be a protracted discussion, and it's going to be a work in progress, because actually, I guess you guys are giving us options. It's going to be up, us, up to us, right, to really balance the budget right now. Um, it is, but you know, definitely I mean, we're willing guys. to, yes, um, you know, work with you guys. And if yeah. you need us to help prepare amendments or to yeah. help run other scenarios, no, I, I'm not in know. any way suggesting yeah. that you guys just, you know, leaving it up. No, no, no. But right. I mean, we figured today was a good chance to have discussion because yes. I don't know where everybody feels. I think probably somewhere is a combination of all four, maybe. Yeah. But you know, um, we're in unprecedented times, and none of us yes. have all the answers. Yeah. Um, I'll just say right now, I'm I'm not going to be supporting any. Uh, real property tax increases. That's out of the question. And I'm not going to be supporting borrowing money from any funds because, as you stated very clearly, it's just kicking it down and kicking it down like just a year from now. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So that, as far as I'm concerned, that's off the table. And I will tell you this. I'm getting second thoughts about the GET, too, if it, if it relates to this emergency. Because that's n that's not what I intended. My my support was never uh, based on balancing the budget or anything like that. It was always to look prospectively to diversify our revenue stream. It was you know my support was never you know to use it as an emergency stopgap measure. So um, you know I mean I still support it somewhat, but. You know, you would think um, logically that more than ever I'd be supporting that thing, but actually it never was my intent to use it as an emergency thing. Now we just have to deal with it. Like any household, you get an emergency, you got to deal with it already. Mm -hmm. So if we got to cut services, we got to cut services. Thanks. Council Member Leloy. Thank you, um, and I appreciate what Ms. Ruggles is trying to do. She's trying to move us in a direction on, you know, where we go from here. And then, you know, Mr. Chung just kind of continued that conversation. I, too, will not support another real property tax increase. Um, I think the other part of this conversation that is missing is not only are we trying to provide funding for this dynamic event, we have to start looking down the road and I had a, a an amendment that moved money from tourism, but now more than ever, I am reconsidering that thought because we need to start thinking about 
revenue generation through our tourism industry, which we are getting a lot of mixed messages, not only here, but abroad. And so, uh, you know, some of the GE numbers was based on a very robust tourism number. And that we're seeing is, you know, tapering down based on the events. So as we discuss this as colleagues, I don't want to forget the piece of, yes, we have to take care of this emergency situation, but we also have to plan for the future and ensure that there'll be some revenue generation two, three, five years down the road, which will then hopefully create a more robust real property tax collection. I mean, I think we're having to look at this through a multi-prong approach, and that's what I needed to share to the rest of you as far as where my thoughts are going with all of this. So I yield at this time. Thank you. Councilmember so O'Hara. <sighs> okay, uh, we do have options, but um, none of them look really that great. And um, I'm going to bring Mr. Yee back up if he'll come. <laughs> as uh, Deanna has pointed out several times, the, the surplus that we have in the geothermal funds li uh, lies within the Community Benefit Fund. This is the most accessible fund, and it is up to Mr. Yi to make approvals on that fund. And if we're looking at a, an amount um, in the neighborhood of $3 million, um, we do have that in that fund without um, violating the rules as they currently exist. What um, are your thoughts about releasing that? Because that that's not borrowing. This is money that we have in the bank. Michael Yee, Planning Director. Not too long ago, um, there was a proposal to fund Wi-Fi through the benefit fund. Um, and we heard a lot from the community around using those funds for a community benefit and not for possible relocation. Uh, and, and that was a very vocal outcry against it. Um, given that there is the other half of it, not financially, but the other side of it, which is relocation, given current events, would we not see a uptick in folks wanting to relocate now? So, so that's one question that, that I'm not sure you're, if people were against it for Wi-Fi, are they going to be against it to use it for a lava event? Um, Mr. Yee? Yes. That would presume that the plant was operating. The plant is no longer operating. This is where we find ourselves today. And if they can cap the 11th well and quench it or whatever the correct term is, um, the community will be a lot safer. The outcry wasn't just about relocation. It was about expending the money to keep the community safe. And when and if PGV ever attempts to come back online, which it may not, the longer that plant stays shut, the more likely it never will reopen. That's the, the facts. Um, I don't know that you'll see an outcry from those people on use of this money to mitigate what's happening in Pune. I don't think you will. But that's, I, I, I've been dealing with them on a daily basis. Many of them have to, are evacuees. Many of the people that you spoke with are not in the neighborhood right now. They're staying with friends and relatives elsewhere. But uh, I am encountering them and talking to them online on a daily basis. And I just, that, that was a different situation. That was business as usual. This is not business as usual. The geothermal plant is shut down. And the likelihood of it reopening, we don't know. Um, that's going to be up to the, the public in, in large regard because there will be a huge, huge um, uh, response from the public if that plant is attempted to be reopened in the future sometime. That's all I can tell you. Well, and so in response to that, I would say the fact is it's not completely shut down and doesn't mean we won't get applications for relocation. 
and to draw a conclusion today that it's pow and, and all done and we can start expended, I think is premature to say that too. And given the timeline of having to make decisions around the budget, I don't know the likelihood of that. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not saying we can't use it. I'm not saying I, I wouldn't forward it as a request to you folks, but I would expect that you're gonna have to listen to what the folks in, impacted by PGV, what they're gonna feel about it. I mean, I wasn't around when they created this fund and, and have questioned about it in the past. I would imagine they would say we, you, we can use it as long as we prevent it from reopening. That's probably going to be the tune that um, comes out of this. But, and and that's, that's a, actually, in my opinion, a reasonable request given the, the course of the events here. Um, Elko is not having any problem keeping the lights on. We have excess capacity without PGV. They're already planning a future without PGV. I've met with them and, and continue to meet with them. Um, but as far as the fact that PGV is not left island, but they are not operating, which means we have no revenue coming into that um, fund anymore. I think we're still holding three unsold homes, which will probably be worth about, you know, a nickel on the dollar um, right now. But um, other than that, there's not going to be any revenues. That's from the royalties of the, the sale of electricity to Helco, which is no longer being produced. And um, what it took to get them to get the pentane off site was ridiculous. The, the public is not real happy, and the, the reason they're not happy is they took forever to start quenching the wells, and they still are not quenched because the one that they're having problems with has been a problematic well for 30 years. The public knows all of this. All these facts are recorded. So um, I think I kind of understand the public view on PGV. They want to see that it remains permanently closed. Um, I know the, the problem for Helco is it reduces the percentage of their um, profile from renewables, which is a problem given the state's goals to get 100% uh, renewable by 2040. Still yet, they have other options for bringing renewables online, and they do um, have enough capacity in their existing plants without PGV being online. So that's going to make that argument even more strong to keep it from coming back online. I can't tell you what the outcome will be. I'm not going to take sides in this argument. I'm just analyzing what I'm seeing in the public and what um, the facts are in terms of generation right now. So that is the most easily available money that we have at this point in time. And because it only takes director discretion to release it. Um, the rest of the funds we would be borrowing from to pay back. This is not a payback necessarily payback situation. And it has put the community through a lot of trauma, the risk that they are um, concerned about because of the slow response of geothermal on all of this, the pentane and the closing of the wells. So I think we have an argument to make here. I just wondered if you want to mull it over, because it's, it's a very important piece. I'm just going to reiterate that it, it's not about me just releasing the funds. Okay, so um, it's not that simple. I think, uh, again, I'm not here supporting or not supporting PGV. That's not the question. The, what's, the ordinance was written partially for the relocation of folks impacted by the PGV. I get that. If the plant remains closed, that could be kind of a mute question at that point, but we're not at that ter determination today. And again, I don't know how fast we can act on these things by the time a decision for budget needs to be made. So again, I'm, I'm open to it, but I don't have a conclusion for you today. Okay. Thank you. And um, we're going to take a 15-minute break, but I see Council Member Chong, so maybe just right after your... I have a question, though. Sure. Given the nature of this matter, are we going to get to speak more than three times? If not, I'm not going to say anything. Is that no, no, no. I, I'm, you know, I yeah. only talk one minute at a time. Yeah, right? no, definitely. I'm just keeping track of how many rounds so that right. I'm just everybody has a fair uh, time. But yeah. um, go ahead and yeah. and then well, we'll take a 15-minute break. I just want, break. you know, 
every so often, I just want to give my colleagues a glimpse into what I'm thinking about in terms of things so when we formulate some kind of decision. Um, you know, I certainly understand where Ms. O'Hara is coming from. Um, and, you know, she is fighting. She has the pulse of that community and um, their welfare, um, you know, uh, in mind. But for the same reasons that I eventually voted or stated my opposition to using some of those geothermal monies, might be a little bit different fund, but those geothermal monies for, you know, some computers or whatever it was down at Pahoa, <clears throat> I got to say it's probably an improper use of the funds. It's not geothermal related. I mean, that's just my thought. Yeah, I don't make that decision though, but you know, I gotta agree with uh, Director Yi in, in many regards. I just had to state my opinion in that. On that, thank you. Okay, thank you. We're gonna take a 15-minute break. Thanks.